Okay, so in the next 10, 15 minutes, um, my mission is to try to walk you through uh, the basic concepts of um, nuclear cardiac imaging. And as you all know, um, nuclear stress tests in the country is the most widely used imaging modality for patients with suspicion for coronary artery disease. So what are the applications for um, nuclear stress testing? So the most common one is actually diagnosing and risk stratifying patients with coronary artery disease. The common modalities are SPECT, which stands for Single Photon Emission uh, Computed Tomography, uh, or actually PET, which is the Positron Emission Tomography. Um, less likely now with these days with actually the uh, advances in ECHO and MRI is actually to use um, myocardial imaging with nuclear for LV function or ejection fraction assessment. Viability is a big thing, and you can get that either with SPECT or PET. Um, in congestive heart failure, there is a new tracer, um, we're relatively new, called the MIBG, basically for risk stratifying patients with heart failure, and there are other miscellaneous um, indications. Um, but we're all familiar with the ischemia cascade. So before the patient ends up having angina from coronary artery disease, um, you usually start from the bottom of the pyramid, where basically uh, there are evidence of perfusion um, which we can detect actually uh, either with a nuclear or with actually CT or cardiac MRI. So number one, in patients who have obstructive coronary artery disease, there is a reduce in coronary perfusion, which leads to a cascade of events, including diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, then you notice the wall motion abnormalities being um, evident, then the EKG changes, and finally, uh, uh, patients basically manifesting with angina. So the basic principle for um, coronary flow reserve. So what we're trying to demonstrate here is um, that at rest and during stress. So at rest, we have basically equally distributed coronary blood flow through all the major coronary artery beds. But what we are trying to do when we are administering either a pharmacological stress or subjecting those patients to an exercise is we're trying to increase the flow in those coronary arteries. If you look to your left, where there is basically a significant coronary artery stenosis, this territory will not be able to augment flow during stress. While if you have a coronary artery that has no significant stenosis, then you can easily increase the flow through that artery anywhere between three to four folds. So that's basically what we're trying to, and that's the whole concept of coronary flow reserve. Above a normal resting volume, how much can I increase my flow through those coronary arteries? Um, now, the resting flow, we can see that patients, even up until having significant coronary artery stenosis, up to 90%, because their resting coronary flow is not high, then they won't really manifest with angina. However, what actually what we do with uh, inducing a stress uh, uh, state, whether by injecting patients with uh, um, uh, vasodilators like regadenosine or adenosine, or by subjecting them to exercise, is that now we are four folds increasing the coronary blood flow, and those patients who will have anywhere from 70 to 80 percent stenosis, they're actually going to they're going to show and declare themselves as having significantly decrease in their coronary flow reserve because of that significant stenosis. So basically, what we're doing is actually increasing the demand for blood flow by subjecting those patients to a stress test. Um, by increasing flow through those coronary arteries. And it's basically a supply-demand equation. If the increase in demand cannot be met by the myocardium, then the myocardium becomes ischemic, and that's what we measure, basically, when we look at um, uh, blood flow using nuclear images. Um, so what are the common radiopharmaceuticals? So these are the tracers that are commonly used um, uh, for nuclear cardiac imaging. So the most common... Ones are basically technetium, and you, have, you probably have heard about uh, systemibi or tetrophosmin. So these are different technetium 99M derivatives. We have actually the old lasting thallium uh, tracer, which is mainly used for viability nowadays. And uh, these are the single photon emitters. So the thallium and the technetium are the commonest ones. And then we also have the positron emitters, uh, by which we have different uh, tracers, including rubidium, N13 ammonia, and O15 water. Um, so Basically, both tetrophosmin or tislamibi, which is basically the technetium, these are the radiopharmacies. They actually have to be uptaken by a myocardium that has intact cellular function. So as you can see, the systemibi, for example, is being uh, taken up by the myocardial mitochondria, while basically tetrophosmin is being uptaken by the cytosol within the myocytes. So if these myocytes, you have any, cell, any evidence of cell necrosis or cell damage, you're not going to see normal uptake of these tracers. 
So as a, a basic concept, after we inject uh, the patient with a radio tracer, and then we're subjecting them to some sort of a stress modality, whether exercise or whether with vasodilators, then we basically have the nuclear camera. So these are basically, uh, um, which compose of a sodium iodide crystal, there's a lead collimator, and then everything, what we're trying to measure, or what we're trying to collect, is the photons that are being emitted as a result of the radioactive decay of the tracer that we are injecting them. So the camera basically collects all those counts. You have a, computer, a um, digitization of all this data, and that basically manifests as a digital uh, image. Um, you probably may or may not have, but this is actually the typical uh, heads for the nuclear camera. So we basically, most of them have two heads, and this camera rotates around the patient in a 180 degree arc in order to collect all those um, uh, photons emitted from the patient's body after being injected. These are the standard views whenever we're looking at a, a, at a uh, pharmacological stress test uh, or a spec is actually you have a um, short axis slice, so where you see the anterior, the inferior wall, the septum, and the lateral wall of the left ventricle. We have the horizontal long axis view, so here what we see is the lateral wall of the heart and then the septal wall of the heart, and then we have the vertical long axis view where you see the anterior and the inferior walls of the myocardium. And this is typically what you see. Um, uh, this is the end product of all those images that are being post-processed, is actually you'll see the stress images on the top, and then you'll see the rest images on the bottom, and these are your short axis slices, these are your horizontal long axis uh, images, and these are your vertical long axis images. And what you are trying to see is, do you have any flow disparity or any heterogeneity in flow? So normally the flow at stress should be equal to the flow at rest. If we do see that the uh, amount of the tracer uptake is decreased with stress compared to rest, then we know that we have coronary artery disease in that territory. So this is basically what you see kind of in a polar map in all three coronary artery distributions, so LAD, left circumflex, RCA. This would be a normal polar map. So basically what we are doing, we're looking at the heart, typically like 16 to 17 segments, similar to what we do on ECHO, and we're assessing for all those segments for whether or not there is normal or abnormal tracer uptake. And then here basically you can see there's a big defect in the left circumflex territory, meaning that 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 territorial artery is um, ischemic. Um, when we're looking at basically at, uh, there are different, uh, model there are different uh, ways of doing stresses. You can either stress the patient first and do the rest imaging, or you can do the rest imaging first and do the stresses. But for the sake of time, we're not gonna go into a lot of those details. These are the common indications for, for, for a spec imaging or a nuclear stress testing. Chest pain, but patients have abnormal EKG, so your diagnostic accuracy of treadmill will be low. Patients who cannot exercise, you have to do a pharmacological stress test. Patients with chest pain with known coronary artery disease, and you can also be indicated in congestive heart failure evaluation. Uh, these are the common vasodilators we have. Adenosine and rigadenosine are probably the two most commonly widely used vasodilators. In the United States, dobutamine is uh, very less frequently used uh, nowadays uh, in the nuclear lab. And what do these uh, vasodilators do? They act on the adenosine receptors. Um, so you have either the non-selective adenosine uh, agonists, and these are antagonists, I'm sorry, and this is the adenosine, or you basically have the rigadenosine, which is more selective in terms of blocking those adenosine receptors. Um, so practically speaking, after you inject the patient with the, um, uh, the stressor, uh, for adenosine, usually you wait for three minutes, and then you're ready to inject the radio tracer, whether it was technetium, uh, which is the most commonly used radio tracer, or patients who basically you are using rigadenosine, it's only a single bolus injection, and you basically start injecting that uh, um, radio tracer a minute after you inject patients with uh, rigadenosine. We, know have, we do have some contraindications basically for using those vasodilators. Uh, commonly patients who have uh, ongoing wheezing or, or um, exacerbation of the, uh, the COPD, patients who have second or third degree AV block because these receptors uh, uh, can affect that, patients who are hypotensive, or if they have had recent use of diperidamol. So this is basically a patient who has a, um, um, so here what we are looking at is a, um, a spec image, so the stress on top, and then you have the rest on the bottom. But what you can appreciate is actually in the uh, inferior wall, there is actually a perfusion defect, if you guys can appreciate that. So this is the rest, and you see there is decreased area of, of 
um, radio tracer uptake in the inferior wall. So you see that more apically. You can see it even here. It's actually involving the apical anterior, the apical inferior wall. And then you can also see it here. Part of the inferoseptum is also involved. So this patient basically, if you look at the polar map, he has an, uh, an inducible ischemia in what looks like uh, RCA slash left anterior descending artery uh, territories. We know basically that from meta-analysis of, uh, of um, a lot of studies that uh, the sensitivity and specificity of nuclear stress tests are actually high. Anywhere from 80%, they're more sensitive than specific. The specificity is anywhere from 70 to 80% and multitude of studies, including exercise and vasodilators. Uh, what we can also obtain from uh, SPECT imaging is myocard is LV functional analysis. So you actually uh, obtain end diastolic volumes, end systolic volumes, and that's basically has to do with the counts, and you can derive an ejection fraction based on that. Um, we also know that patients who have normal uh, SPECT imaging or nuclear cardiac stress testing, they have extremely high uh, negative predictive value and very favorable prognosis with a less than 1% annual event rate. Um, and these are the patients who have normal perfusion. Uh, just to kind of end up here, um, I'm just gonna show you there are now new cameras uh, in the market. Um, so basically from using the old uh, generation um, uh, sodium iodide crystals. Now we have patients who can be sitting up in a chair and having the camera more like a stationary camera, obtaining images, and you even can have patients who are a little bit of a recline or even actually supine, and you can actually image them instead of being laying supine and or uh, prone. Some of the new tracers, um, there are, um, over the past 10 years, there has been some interest in using iodine, MIBG, and this tracer is actually uptaken uh, by the norepinephrine transmitters, which are present at the synaptic terminals. And patients who have congestive heart failure, uh, they actually lose that transport mechanism. So they no longer have active norepinephrine uptake. So we can see in normal, when you inject those patients with the tracers, you have good myocardium uptake. While patients who have congestive heart failure, they do not uptake that radio tracer, which is the uh, uh, 123 iodine MIBG. And that has been shown in multiple studies to carry um, um, prognostic markers. Uh, one last uh, word actually about PET. Uh, uh, positron emission thermography uses, as we said, three different tracers, rubidium or um, uh, N13 uh, ammonia. Um, and basically what it does is um, the same concept. You're actually measuring or you're actually imaging the decay of those tracers as they are being injected through a special camera called a PET camera. And what are the advantages of PET over SPEC? You actually have much better spatial resolution. Uh, you have better imaging, especially in obese patients. And it's actually much shorter acquisition time compared to SPEC, so 30 minutes. You can get a whole study, and there is a multitude of prognostic data and risk stratification using cardiac PET. This is an example of a patient with a technetium. Uh, SPECT versus rubidium, you can see you have better definition, better spatial resolution, better counts. So you basically, you can see things much better. Um, and then last but not least, there has been, over the past few years, a talk about patients who have cardiac um, uh, transthyretin amyloidosis. So that's basically your senile type, and there is more interest now in using nuclear cardiac imaging, like this um, uh, technetium pyrophosphate, which actually uh, gets uptaken by um, um, uh, tissues that have avid calcium binding. And for unclear reasons, but apparently that myocytes that has actual infiltration with uh, uh, the amyloid deposits, they actually tend to bind to this agent. So you can actually now, with very high sensitivity, up to 90% and very high specificity, you can actually obtain a good diagnostic uh, uh, test by using um, nuclear uh, cardiac imaging, which is in this case, technetium pyrophosphate. Thanks. Sir.